So good afternoon and welcome to Grand Bahama. I wanted to show you the location of the Rand Nature Center in relation, special relationship to the airport and to the downtown area of Freeport and also in relation to Lukai National Park because the deputy park wardens here work between the two parks, the Rand Nature Center and Lukai National Park. The Rand Nature Center is located on East Settlers Highway directly opposite to Grand Bahama Catholic High School. <clears throat> it is really easy to access from and very easy to find once you get on the Settlers Bay. I want to point out that we have uh, residents on property and I will mention that later in the presentation but this arrow points to the, in the direction of where the residence is located and the other arrow points you in the direction that you will travel in order to get to the office and the main building of the, on the park. This is the driveway and the entrance to the office building which is located at, situated at the bottom of this, this driveway and the paving on this, on this drive is what is referred to as green paving. It was installed courtesy of the Midwest group that wanted to have a place where they can actually demonstrate the, one, the use of the machinery and also to put in a sample area where people could come and have a look at, at the, the product. And what this has done is that it's smoothed off the, the surface, it's made it quite uniform and it makes it um, really dust free and that's that is the objective of the product. And so it was a win win situation for the Bahamas National Trust to have that surface installed. The Rand Nature Center is the head office for the Bahamas National Trust on Grand Bahama Island. And these main doors, that, um, I'll take you inside in a few minutes and show you around the building. I want to point out too that the first solar heater on the island was installed here at the Rand Nature Center and it's still functional and in use. And again, we're now in the foyer as you enter the room, in the foyer in the gift shop. And I'd like to introduce you to our office manager, Lisa Wild Boots. She's usually the first person that visitors meet when they come to the to the Rand Nature Center, but all of us act as, as greeters and as, as um, reception areas and we do have volunteers who assist in that area as well. We also have a sign-in sheet that we do ask or invite visitors to sign in and that way we can track where our visitors are coming from. Now, oh, as you stand in the foyer, when you look, there's a door that will take you to your left that goes to the exhibit room and the door to your area to your right will take you into the art gallery. You will need all of those in a few minutes. Just a brief history of the Rand Nature Center. It was established in 1969 by the late Dorothy Rand and um, she did this in memory of her husband, James Henry Rand, a renowned philanthropist of Freeport who died the previous year. Dr. Paul Fluff was hired as the director. He was the first director here and he was here for many years. And he was um, an oncologist and he, he worked with birds and school groups were, like, were invited to come in and the public came in and he was someone who actually fed the birds out of his hand. There's still a lot of migratory birds that pass through this area. So this was the first environmental education facility in the Bahamas and it became an important bird landing station and it remains a very popular bird watching spot to this day. And I just put in here as, as a notice um, point of interest, Ricardo Lightborn, who is now on ZNS as a, um, one of the newscasters, he was the person who became director when Dr. Clark left. Mm -hmm. And he stayed here for several years. The Rand Nature Center became a national park in 1992 when the Bahamas National Trust assumed responsibility for it. It is Grand Bahamas most accessible national park, meaning that it's very close to the downtown area 
and the prices are very affordable and, and five dollars for admission for adults and children five to twelve is three dollars, children under five to three. We have data tools available Tuesdays and Thursdays um, at ten thirty AM and we recommend that people call in and, and um, book a tour for group. The staff here consists of myself, um, Lisa that you've met already, David Clare, Ellsworth Weir and David Cooper, as well as Mr. Ivan Lang, who is a retired park warden, but he also assists um, with Lukai National Park as needed. The Glory Harris Banks Art Gallery came about through the quest from the state of the late Glory Harris Banks. And um, it, it was her dream was to promote young Bahamian artists and special exhibits. And so we've had several of them. I only put two here. The AIDS exhibit was held here with Antonius Roberts and Chantel Bethel. Um, Freedom Call was also here, was also held here. And the Grand Bahama Artist Association holds two shows here annually. They have an annual Thanksgiving exhibit and their annual Valentine's exhibit in February. Thanksgiving is in November. Now we enter into our exhibit room and our exhibit room features a selection of indigenous straw work that we just have a small display of it to just to um, introduce visitors to the work that's done in the Bahamas and these are some of the older pieces. We also have our fact sheets to put here uh, out front. We have displays of shells and corals that are on display and some behind here that you wouldn't see on this picture. Um, then we have posters along here and then informational boards, historical boards to begin with the history of Grand Bahama and the Bahamas starting from the Arawak going all the way to the Hawksville Creek Agreement and to the development of Freeport. So people are encouraged to stop in here and look around and read the information and just familiarize themselves a bit more with the park and the Bahamas. This is the door that we will exit to go on our tours and we'll see more of that in a bit. The exhibit room is also used for our teachers workshops which are held annually and they're quite popular as you can see and teachers of all ages come and get quite involved and they get excited about um, learning more about the environment especially seeing that more and more of the Bahamian um, environment has been included on the curriculum. It's something that we're finding that more and more teachers are seeking assistance with specific topics, especially to do with native plants. Environmental education takes place for all ages. We have meetings here. We have from kindergartens to the senior citizens group visit us. And all of our meetings are held here. We also have a very a small select collection of books which are available to our members. Uh, we're not a lending library, but people are welcome to come in and we encourage them to come in and, and have a, a look at them and they can use materials. And I want to mention a very special lady, Elaine Talmo, volunteers weekly. She's retired from the Charles the Child Favorite Library and she's been donating of her time for the past year. And she's committed herself to continue on with this. Our school groups would then exit through this and as you can see they come prepared, they, they often come with specific questions that they have to ask and answer and so they're looking for general and um, for specific information most often. The trail begins in the same area. We have the beginning of the trail that will take people to follow the trail and it winds up to the pond and I'll carry you along the trail and the trail also ends at the same place. So people often ask um, 100 acres of pine forest can we get lost? And the answer is always no, not if you stay on the trail. They're all connected. We'll bring you right back to where you started. <laughs> um, the tour begins here and we usually highlight five trees in this area. The weeping fig, uh, the maho, which is here, the mahogany, which is off to this side, the sea grape, which you can see in the foreground, and the poor man's office over here. And I like to point out the importance of trees at this point because it's usually a very cool area and so 
people really understand can understand and appreciate the importance of trees and how they how they um, help us. Like I said, it's a hundred acres of pine forest, and Pine Bahama is one of the four islands with pine trees. And my aim today is to show you that the pine forest is anything but barren. It truly is alive with lots of different things to see. The trail is easily accessible and people, you can follow the trail along and it also acts as a fire break. Unfortunately, we, or fortunately, depends on how you look at it, sometimes we, we have had incidents of fire on property along the edges of the, the perimeter of the property, but what we found is that these five trails actually do work as fire breaks and we'll understand that a bit later. Some of the plants that you'll see on your walk are Pauta, the Brasilito, the Thatch Palm and Morning Glory and the Guana Berry. As you can see I love flowers. <laughs> we have guided tours and we point out the bush medicine, the plants that are used in bush medicine and those that are used in uh, Bahamian, Bahamian cultural heritage. And so here I'm pointing out a frangipani tree that most likely was put here, but it was used for making, the white flowers were used for making perfume. Some other plants that you'll see along the trail are wild garber and five finger, and then you have strong bark, myrcene, guana berries, amelami, poison wood, black torch, Cuban holly, Century plant, Madeira or mahogany tree, Sapodillis on the trail, Inkwood, Mulberry, and Princewood. We have students of all ages um, coming through, and as you can see, they all they can become quite enthralled with what they see and are asking questions as we go along. This group specific topic may be requested by the teacher in this particular class to study the uses of native plants. Now this area, I often stop at this point and this is a junction of two trails and this area is a good example of, of um, what happens after pine forest burns and this burn took place about three years ago and you can see that the pine forest has remained um, as a pine forest should with the understory which is predominantly thatch palm and then the upper story of the, of the pine tree. Directly opposite to that same point, right across the trail, there was no fire in this particular area. And so the hardwood trees are emerging and it's a really good birding spot because this is where your wild garber, guana berries, poison wood, um, the berries are and birds really do frequent this area. And so we do need a balance with the hardwood and the pine trees. Again, the trail continues along to the pond, and this path is carrying us to the pond. And the area to the left, you can see the difference of the trail. In this area, the pine trees are coming back to the left. And this happened several years ago, more than six years ago. And the trees stand about, some of them about four to five feet height now. But on the opposite side of the trail, where there was no fire, um, we can see the hardwood is really prevalent there. Now the pond continues and this is the entrance to the pond area and this arrow would show you the path that we would continue along to go to the arboretum and we'll come to that in a bit. Around the pond area, um, while the, the Grand Nature Center is a natural area, you would notice that there are plants that have been put in around the pond area and the, around the building and they were there for specific reasons. The pond offers trails that wind around the pond and they allow visitors to view the pond from different angles and it's really a beautiful spot and oftentimes when we see children here they don't want to leave. We have seats here and they sit and they, they stop and the breeze is cold because it's coming off the water and the birds are here because of the vegetation and because of the water. And this is a gazebo that was put in as a part of the plans for re-establishing the pond and creating the arboretum. So the gazebo is a favorite spot too. We have benches there where we invite that invite visitors to sit down and, and just rest and enjoy the gardens. The viewing deck is 
usually the, des the, the destination for our groups and this is where people stop and they they able to see the, the pond and look at the vegetation, look at the birds and most people who come in the back here, um, a lot of people who come from the Nature Center are true nature lovers and they are very much interested in seeing the natural environment and what impresses them a lot is the fact that this park is so close to uh, an urban area but once you come inside those gates, it is so quiet, it's very hard to even hear what is going on outside. The trees really act as a really good buffer. And so you feel like you in the window in the wilderness when you're actually very close to town. We have benches placed around the pond area um, and tables that give people the opportunity to stop and and um, and rest if they would like to. I'm just noticing this picture here in the background. You notice that there is a birdhouse there. That was put in several years ago by Cornell University. And this little bird on top is a Bahamas swallow. And it fools a lot of people. They come and ask, um, what is that bird? They thought it was, but it's a decoy. But it, it, it actually is a really good replica of the bird. And the houses were put in, uh, put in as a, an experiment to see if the Bahamas swallow would actually come and nest into an area that is frequented by people, but they haven't taken the boxes. They still stay mostly out east and mostly out west in the really thick pine forest. And we're now moving into our arbor native fruit, tropical, native and tropical fruit tree arboretum. And this is Pan arboretum, and I'm going to walk you through it now. And this is the view from the arboretum of the pergola and the pond would be behind the pergola to the left. And this area is one that is going to be a living project, one that is ongoing. And as you walk along the trail, you'll notice that there are plantings of palm trees that are there in the palm gardens and that's leaves again. And we are putting in native plants in an area that was a, that is a pine forest area. So you can see that the soil is not very um, nutrient rich. So it's a, it's a challenge, but it's one I think that is coming along beautifully. The banana trees, the fruit trees are here. You have bananas, mango, avocado, guava, other trees that are in this area. And the hedge along the edge of the, um, the perimeter of the arboretum is cocoa plant. And now we're looking at the bush medicine plants that are here, um, white sage and some others that are planted in this area, and more photos of the arboretum. And then we look at our fauna. We have several birds here, in three actually. I have pictures, photos of two. This is Luke. Luke is a red-tailed hawk, and Luke resides at the Rand Nature Center. It's been here for quite a long time, from the 1990s, I think 92. And he's quite popular with the students. Um, most of them look at it and think it's an owl, and then we get an opportunity to explain to them that it's a hawk and it's a raptor and talk more about this particular bird. It's actually quite a very beautiful bird. And this is Ellsworth. This is our deputy park warden. He has recently taken up snake handling and he's holding a Bahama boa that we have named Benny, Benny the boa. And they reside in a cage that's right off to, to the right of, of my screen. And there are two snakes there. And we have the Bahama boa on exhibit um, as an educational, as a main part of the educational program, but especially because the Bahama bow is not found naturally in Grand Bahama. Um, we do have other snakes. The Abaco boa is the second snake that's on display, and like its name suggests, it's only found in Abaco. And then we do have a snake that we do see quite often here at the Rani to send the brown racer. It's a little black snake. Um, I refer to it as a garden snake, a uh, brown racer with a little brownish head. If you look closely, you can almost see the brown on the head. And the worm snake here was my first time seeing one of them. This was found on the property as well, and we took a photo of that. And then, of course, we have a curly tail lizard and a no lizard. Those are some of the um, animals that you will find here, reptiles and so forth, amphibians. 
then we have a person of the most interesting um, animals that you would see. We will start with the Atelier history butterfly first. The cocoons that underneath that underneath the butterfly actually are the um, cocoon, uh, the larva of the Atelier history butterfly. Um, we've seen them now several years, but we have I really haven't had an opportunity to see the butterfly itself. But it's evidence that they're here because we find the eggs and the, the pupa and the larvae on the Kunti plant, which is the host plant for the, the eggs of the Atelier Hair Street butterfly. Quite recently, we had a trick. We were able to get a really good photo and get up close to a Chuck Wills widow that is sitting on the ground here. And we do have raccoons here. And they are left over from the time when the Rare Nature Center, as an educational center, they actually did. Um, feed the raccoons, and raccoons are prevalent all over Grand Bahama, so they're part of um, the life here. We do have turtles in the pond as well, and these are outstanding themselves, and they, they reside and they stay in the pond. Um, our second epic talk is David Clare. He is um, he is holding Donnie, our Bahama parrot, is perched on his shoulder, and Donnie is our official leader. She is located, her cage is located just to the front of the building and she actually does whistle. If you ignore Donnie, she will whistle at you so you can come and say hello to her. And David is her, really her most favorite person. He's the only person I know and elsewhere has started to carry him and carry him like this too. Um, Donnie doesn't allow me to do that. And then we put in a butterfly garden at the front of the building and this was because we realized that we were not getting as much butterflies. We see them on the property, but they weren't coming around the front, and that's where most people would be. And we wanted an area where we would actually see them, have an opportunity to see them up close, and it worked. We have the monarch butterfly comes here, and we know that. And some of the others are the zebra longwing, the Mexican fritillary, and the Bahamas swallowtail. And um, that has become a very special butterfly to us, which is not a really good one, but if you look closely, it's um, right among the leaves, but it comes in and, and it's one of the hardest butterflies to, to photograph because it moves so very quickly. Now this is, I think, my most favorite place on the property. This is what we refer to as the orchid bowl. It's located to the front of the building again and right behind Donnie's cage. It's a very sheltered area lots of shade which is really perfect for orchids and the orchids are being added into this area and we're putting more these were have been here for like 10 years and once a year we're treated to this beautiful bloom and it has the most exquisite fragrance that you can imagine um, you can tell I love flowers around the building we have cleared out around the building and that's the fire break because the office sits right in the middle of the pine forest and it's really nestled and tucked into the trees. So this area around the building is kept cleared and that serves several purposes. It, oh, it just jumped. Okay, let me um that jump and then I'll come back to that. Out front I wanted to point out that um we do use our driveway for our events. And the market, this is the market that's held the last Saturday of the month. It's um, held there on the driveway. And when we hold events and like this, we ask people to park outside. And Caltech has always been very gracious and allowed us to use the parking lot. And we have decided just recently that we will continue with the market through the summer with no break. And that's due to very popular requests from all of the, actually all of the vendors have asked that. Um, we do that and the point is that we get fruits in the summer so we're looking forward to that and seeing how that's going to work out for us. Um, behind the building again, remember I mentioned that the fire breaks serve to a purpose, the bird baths are placed around the building and in strategic spots around along the trail and this we keep them filled with water and birds come in and they come in usually in the morning and then about 3.30, 4 o'clock, they start coming in again. So if you're in the 
building, you can actually just stand to the windows and, and really do good bird watching from inside even. And this is the view that could be seen from the exhibit room. I put up some photos of some of the birds that we do see here. We have lots of migratory birds that pass through. Um, most of these here were, some of, all of these here were, were brought, some of them came in on their own, but two of the bottom were brought in. But the hummingbird, the hooded warbler, the oven bird, and the black biscuit, vireo, and the pine warbler all got into the building and couldn't get out. So what happens is oftentimes we have to actually catch them and take them outside. And it's, a, it's an experience, I can tell you. It's really a thrilling experience. The owl was, was um, someone thought that it was, something was wrong with it. We realized it was just sleeping because it was the daytime. And so we just held it and just released it. We don't keep birds in captivity like that, only the ones that we have permission to do so. And the white crown pigeon, the amazing thing about this is someone picked it up, they actually thought it was dead. And we, we just told them, we sat outside, put it in a box and watched it and it just came, revived itself and flew away. The residence, as I meant, that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, is really tucked to the to the beginning of the property. It is where guests, including visiting guests and staff, would stay. And the staff here is responsible for the for taking care of and to take care of the residents. But what's interesting thing about this is that people come here every day and don't know that there's a residence on property. People pass this gate and don't even realize that it's there. And it's not visible from the road at all. So it's quite secluded and, and um, really a lovely, lovely area. I put in here um, this photo of Jaquiro Spence. He volunteered with us last year. And this was a turtle skull that he found um, and he brought in. Then he realized what was on the straight head around Nature Center. And, and it's interesting to see just how large this is. And we would love it if someone can take a guess at how old that turtle was. Um, but it is on display here. It stays here um, on display in the exhibit room at the Nature Center. This is um, someone that came in, visited the Nature Center, saw the turtle shells that we have on display and he volunteered his time and materials to come and just to help preserve the shell and it really worked because um, it's really fragile and it's helped to keep them in really good condition that keeps them on view for a longer period of time. And that brings me, I see that I am quite quick in my presentation, but this brings me to the end of our presentation. This is Donnie. And um, we're at a point now where I would gladly entertain any questions that you may have. Bianca has a question. You are unmuted. Okay, the question was, what is a chuck willow? Chuck willow's widow? Yeah. It's a, a bird that um, is usually nocturnal, and that's what made it really exciting to see that in the day. It's the one that you hear making that noise at night, usually at dusk. It makes a, like a, I can't make bird sounds, but here in Freeport we hear it quite often. Um, it's usually perched on a branch, and so because of the mottled look of its feathers, it blends in, so it's really hard to see. So for us to see that, it was really a, really a treat. How it got its name, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> we, we don't know. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to launch a poll. We'd like an idea of how many of you have visited the RAND Nature Center. And Claudine has a question mm -hmm. as well. Claudine. Okay, so I wanted to know which areas are managed by the Ryan Nature Center, um, like which parks exist, exist in Grand Bahama. Okay, we have um, three parks in Grand Bahama. 
the first one, can I go back to the beginning portion? Sure. Okay. Um, the RAN Nature Center, which is located near Freeport, and then we have um, Wakai National Park, which is located further east, still in Freeport, but it's located closer to High Rock. And then Pearson Key is uh, it's actually the smallest national park in the system. It's located off the southern coast of Grand Bahama, and I don't know if you can see the arrow, but it's in this general area. It's directly opposite to Barbary Beach. And so the uh, Ryan Nature Center is the headquarters for the Bahamas National Trust. The Bahamas National Trust manages the three parks on Grand Bahama. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I, I'm going to share the results. It looks like most of you have gone to the, oh, okay. the RAN. 27% yeah. haven't. All right, any other questions? Um, Lakeisha is on. Lakeisha, Lakeisha, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. Um, well, I would say that the, the property is a very beautiful property that has a lot of potential um, and we will be looking more towards um, the staff helping out, particularly with um, different activities that would include invasive species removals around the pond area and around the park. Um, and we're just looking to put, you know, to find ways to, to raise money to really put more infrastructure into that park. But it's a beautiful property and for the 27% that has not visited, we encourage you to do so. And also in terms of future plans, Lakeisha, is there anything you can share at this time? Or? Future plans for RNC? Yeah, or any uh, for Grand Bahama or Grand Bahama in general? Well, for Grand Bahama in general, we are working towards expanding the Peterson King National Park to include the surrounding coral reef system. We are looking towards expanding the Lukayan National Park to encompass more of the cavern system, the entire creek system, as well as some of the offshore reef. And we're also looking towards establishing two new additional parks on the islands. We've been doing a lot of work, community work, as well as um, field assessments. And we're hoping to have proposals submitted to government by September, October the latest. Okay. And Peter, I'm going to unmute your line. You have a question? Okay. I just, um, as you see on my question, I don't really have a question. I used to live in Grand Bahama, but um, that your presentation far exceeded my expectations. And I just wanted to congratulate you on a great webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Cecilia. Thank you. That is great. Um, so is there, did, so did you visit the park, um, bef the area of the RAND, before it was a park, Peter? Were you in Grand Bahama around that time? Oh, I was, I used to um, live in Freeport in 69 again in 74. Oh, okay. So I, and, you know, of course, in those days, there was a lot of hubbub around, um, you know, the other park, which is um, looked okay. after by the, the development company, I believe, isn't it? Yeah. What is that? The Garden of the Groves? The Garden of the Groves. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. I'll just check. I mean, I covered everything. Uh, Claudine also has a has another question. Claudine. Okay, good. I'm asking this question on behalf of Shakara Scavello. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. She said she, um, Cecilia had mentioned that there are fires. Mm -hmm. She wanted to know how often are there um, fires. We fires occur quite often in Grand Bahama, but we really are very vigilant um, with, with watching for them. We had one early last year, but we were able to contain it. And they usually do creep along the perimeter of the property. So they come through the fence. And once we spot them, we really try to contain them. 
And uh, the one that burnt the park, the one that I, the area that I spoke about, that came in from the eastern part of the property, and that came at night. So we, um, you know, we, we saw the fire. The fire engines were there, but things happened. Yeah. But we, um, we, like I said, you know that fire works work, and so we often, we're very vigilant with that, really very much aware of that. So if there's a fire in this area, someone gets in the car to find out where the fire is and to spot it and to keep an eye out. She said awesome. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for attending. We really do appreciate your support and staff, especially because we like when you're able to talk about these areas. And, and Cecilia, thank you for being um, the presenter today. I enjoyed your presentation, so I'm sure other people did as well. Yeah. And even though I've visited them a number of times, I, I still learned something. Okay, that's, that's, that's good. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.